<laughs> Hello, and welcome to a colorful palette of family engagement strategies for early childhood educators. My name is Kelly Rawl, and I'm the coordinator for pre-kindergarten and family engagement for HEB ISD. Uh, over the last five or six years, I have acquired a whole new appreciation for the power of family engagement. And hopefully by the time we're done today, you will see the benefits as well. This is our agenda for today. First, we're going to talk about powerful partnerships. Then we're going to talk about what is the actual definition of family engagement and what does that look like? And then we're going to get into some actual strategies that you can actually take back to your classroom and try Monday, if you like. First, the first one will be welcoming, developing a welcoming environment and culture in your center. Then we'll talk about art and drama, and I sprinkled a little bit of music in there as well, just for fun. Then we're going to look at blocks, toys, and games, and how families can use those to support their child's learning. And then the sciences, science and the outdoors. We'll look at, look at a few behavior strategies, and then we'll wrap it all up so that you can complete your survey, get the code word, and, um, and earn your credit for this hour video, one hour video. Okay, so let's get started. Powerful partnerships. As we all know, families are uh, every child's best first teacher. And they will remain the most influential voice in a child's head forever. So when children are thinking of uh, whether or not they want to do something or they're going to do something, then they will first hear their parents' voice in their head. However, families and parents have been cited as being an educator's most untapped resource. It's about time that we tap into those resources and make use of our family's willingness to help their children at home. So this is the title of a book written by Dr. Uh, Karen Mapp. It's called Powerful Partnerships, A Teacher's Guide to Enhancing Families for Student Success. And one of the first things that she does in this book uh, is she asks you to consider what does family engagement mean to you? Um, when you think about what family engage engagement means to you, it it probably means something different to uh, the other people in the room. So we have about 200 people in attendance at our um, preschool partnership uh, event today. And <clears throat> if we asked all 200 what family engagement means to you, we would probably get 200 different answers. And uh, some of them would overlap and some of them would not. And the reason for that is because uh, what it means to you depends on your past experience with family engagement. So here's an example. As a child, uh, my family, my parents were uh, pretty engaged, I would say. Um, they helped us when they're, with our homework when we needed it. My mom, uh, they were members of the PTA. I think my mom was a room mother at some point. And, um, and they went to our the programs, you know, concerts and plays and things like that. So I would say that they were engaged in mine and my sister's um, education. However, um, if you as a child grew up in a family where your parents had a bad experience at school, then they may not, um, they may have instilled in you um, a bad uh, attitude, I guess, toward the educational system, toward public education. Oh, you have to go to school every day, but I'm not going in there. I've, I've, um, I had a bad experience there. They don't care about me. They don't care about you. Just go in and do your work and, and then you'll move on to the next school when you're done it at whatever level you're at. So, uh, sometimes families bring their own baggage from their past schooling experience. And so family engagement means something might mean something different to you. 
So just keep that in mind as we look at the definition that Dr. Matt provides us with. And I really like this definition and I just want you to take a minute to read it to yourself. Family engagement is a full, equal, and equitable partnership among families, educators, and community partners to promote children's learning and development from birth through college and career. This definition speaks to me volumes. One of the things that jumps out to me is that family engagement begins at birth, and it doesn't end, so to speak, until college and career. So uh, family engagement actually begins when children are born, and then it continues, uh, perhaps in your centers, where they um, put their children in daycare, and then they go on to the public schools or, or whatever school of choice they uh, decide to use. And then, but what we see is that families are typically more engaged in the early grades than they are uh, in the middle to upper grades. So pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, uh, families are, are there, they are engaged. And then as the kids become more independent and they go up in grade level, then they often become uh, a little less engaged because they're trying to allow their children to become more independent, which is very important. But that continued engagement up through the upper grades of elementary school and into junior high and high school is also very important. So it is uh, something else that speaks to me here is that everybody, families, educators, and community partners have to work together to promote child children's learning and development. Okay, so remember that saying it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it certainly does take a village. Uh, in a lot of cases to raise a child. And then the last thing that I want to mention is that it's a full, equal, and equitable partnership. So it's not just the um, school system or your campus or your center that says, hey, your child is doing A, B, and C. And because of that, we really think that you need to talk, contact Child Find and have your child tested. And then the parents don't have any say in that. It's not a discussion. It's, it's the system telling the families what to do. And then the families decide whether they're going to do it or not. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But really, when we're talking about family engagement, we're talking about meaningful two-way communication. Hey, we noticed that your child is doing A, B, and C at school. What are you seeing at home? Uh, do you know why this might be happening? Um, and then from there, uh, you move into whether or not uh, an assessment might be appropriate. Um, but it's, it's definitely a two-way system of communication. So in her book, Dr. Mapp lays out four core beliefs about family engagement. They're related to hopes and dreams, capacity, partners, and responsibility. So the first one says, that all families have dreams for their children and want the best for them. And, and that's true. As a teacher, I never had a family come in and say, well, I don't really care what happens to my child. You know, they make their own choices. What they always come in and say is, hey, I want my child to do the best they can. And I really hope that uh, they turn out better than I did or they're more successful in life than I was. And so uh, that's a very common thing for families to voice uh, at parent teacher conferences or open house or uh, in lots of different settings, but everybody wants the best for, your, for their children. The second one is capacity. All families have the capacity to support their child's learning. So capacity, they have the skills, they have the ability to do that. Now, sometimes um, families know innately how to help their children at home and support their child's learning. But sometimes families need a little help from us, the educators, to uh, learn how to help their child at home. And once they know how, they're more than willing to do that 
uh, as needed. Partners, families and school staff are equal partners. Remember what I said about that two-way street uh, with communication? Uh, families and school staff are equal partners. So it's not me telling the families what to do or you telling the families what to do. It's a, hey, here's what I'm seeing kind of thing. And what are you seeing? And what do you think would be the best option uh, at, to move forward so that, there, that your child does end up with the most positive experience and best opportunities in the end? The last one is responsibility. This one is really important. The responsibility for cultivating and sustaining partnerships among school, home, and communities rest primarily with school staff, especially school leaders. Oh, wow. That really puts it back on us to initiate that meaningful two-way communication. So, uh, what I would encourage you to do is uh, think about your campus administration. If you're a director, think about your feelings about family engagement. And if you are um, supportive of family engagement, then it's going to be easy for you to go back and say, hey, I think this is an area we can improve on. But uh, a lot of people, and, and I don't blame anybody one bit because it certainly can seem this way, but um, developing a family engagement program for your campus uh, can be very time consuming and thus it can seem like just one more thing to do when really you're, you're bogged down in the day in day out operations of your facility. So if you're a teacher and your administrator is not uh, on board or if you're the administrator and your staff is not on board, then start small. So work with one class or, or work with your own class. Offer family engagement activities. Uh, engage the parents more uh, often. Make some calls home that let them know their, how their children are doing. Just uh, start simple with one class and then it, it will turn into a ripple effect. People will, other teachers in the building, your administrators, they will see uh, something special going on in your classroom. And then they're going to want to be a part of it. So uh, start small and, and build up. The sky's the limit, right? Now, this model is, uh, was developed by Dr. Steve Constantino. And he shared it with us in his book called Every, Engage Every Family, Five Simple Principles. And this model is from his second edition. And it changed, one, one thing changed on this model. But it begins with, Number one up here, a culture that engages every family. So remember on the agenda, we're gonna be talking about culture and a welcoming environment. That fits right along with what he tells us um, we should do. And then communicate effectively and develop those relationships. We talked about two-way communication before also. And every guru for family engagement will tell you that it's all about the relationships. And I can give you tons of examples where um, families and schools are able to uh, carve out the best path for a child when they have a respectful relationship or a positive relationship. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then build a family efficacy. And this was what he changed. Instead of saying empower every family like he did in the first edition, he said, build family efficacy. And so what you're doing here is you're building that capacity, like we talked about in the core beliefs. You're building that capacity of families to support their child's learning and then uh, to be actively engaged uh, with the child, with the teacher, with the administration, with the PTA in all aspects of the educational process, which includes decision-making, which is step number four, engage every family in decision-making. So in that example that I used earlier, your child is doing A, B, and C, and we think it's time to initiate testing. Or we think it's time that your child goes on a behavior contract. Or we think your child needs to be in advanced academics. 
you know, it's not always a bad thing, uh, but there is a decision-making process involved there and families need to be part of that when anything involves their child. And then number five is engage the greater community. You know, we have a wealth of um, community resources within our school district, uh, Six Stones, uh, Mission Central, uh, Need, all of these places are dedicated to helping families, but that's not all of them. There are hundreds, I'm, I'm sure there are at least a hundred faith-based organizations who are ready, willing, and able to help families uh, who are in need or who need support. Uh, so these are some of the resources too, that when you get to this point, um, engaging the greater community can be a huge benefit. Okay, so Dr. Karen Mapp, Dr. Steve Constantino are two of the most current um, experts in the field of family engagement. And that's where I have gotten the majority of my training uh, in the last five or six years. So these are all things for you to think about. But the bottom line is that children who have engaged families tend to have better attendance at school. They tend to make better grades. They tend to uh, have a more positive out outlook on uh, going to school. Uh, they are better able to make friends. They um, are more likely to uh, take higher level classes when they get to junior high and high school, and they're more likely to graduate and go on to uh, college or tech school or the military. So um, the benefits of family engagement, the doing all this work that is recommended by uh, Dr. Mapp and Dr. Constantino, it's worth it. It is worth every minute of it. So don't, um, don't think that uh, the work that we are about to embark on is not worth it. It is worth it. Okay, so I told you we're going to get started with um, some strategies that you can take back to your center and use right away. So let's do that. Uh, and the first one is going to be uh, developing a welcoming environment and culture on your campus. Remember, you only have one chance to make a first impression. If, if the first impression doesn't go well, though, I just want you to know that it is also possible to improve someone's first impression uh, if it doesn't go well at the beginning. Okay, so when you are creating a welcoming environment at your school, you first want to ask yourself, does your school say welcome? Come on in. We're glad you're here. You know, um, with safety being one of the chief concerns about schools uh, and um, campuses in general, uh, public places in general, um, we sometimes see a sign on the front door that says, stop, ring the doorbell and tell us why you're here. Then we'll decide whether or not you get to come in or not. Mm. Does that really say welcome to our school? So what are, the, what are some of the things that you could do to um, mitigate that negative message that might come across? Well, for one thing, you could work with a school council or a school culture team. We call them, we have goal teams on our schools. And, um, you know, the PTAs have teams. Uh, there are lots of people who would be willing to help um, uh, re-image your school into something that does say, welcome, I'm glad you're here. So then after you um, make some changes to the exterior or the entryway of your school, then it's always important to survey your students and your guests alike. You can just do a two question survey that says on a scale of one to five with five being the best and one being the worst, um, how would you rate your uh, experience today? Did you feel welcome when you came in our building? Um, and then uh, if not, what could we do to improve that sense of welcoming when you come inside? And you'll get people who give you very honest answers. And then you'll have some who say, oh, it was a five and no changes needed. 
So um, just be sure that when you do read your responses that you um, think about, remember that this was one person's experience. If you only have one negative response, then that's just one person's experience while everybody else has a positive response. But if you have multiple negative responses, then that's something that you would probably want to address uh, right away so that your school does have a more welcoming environment. The next thing is appreciate the culture of your community. HEB is so much more diverse than it was when I went to Bell High School. Well, of course that was in the dinosaur age, but uh, things are very different now than they were then. And um, that's, just, that's a great thing. We're so diverse here. Um, that gives us the opportunity to celebrate different cultures, to learn about different cultures. So one thing that you could do is offer a cultural celebra celebration, cultural awareness night. Uh, if you have um, a high population of Arabic or Hindi or uh, Spanish speaking families in your community, then, uh, or people from who are from Louisiana or California or Alaska, where they're just, they haven't lived here in North Texas their whole lives, then ask those people to set up a table in your uh, gym or, or your library, wherever you're going to um, hold your event and say, uh, have them share maybe some favorite foods or some examples of um, cultural dress, um, maybe cultural music or dances. So the more that you do that, the more appreciated they feel and the more uh, they can, uh, when they walk around, they can learn about other cultures in your building too. So everybody learns about everybody and develops a mutual uh, respect and an understanding that they might not have had before. Um, you could also, instead of having one main event, uh, highlight a different culture each month uh, or week or however, whatever your um, time increment might be. So um, identify families who can help you develop these learning units and, and highlight um, different cultures so that you are demonstrating this willingness to learn more about someone else's culture. You know, you can celebrate families all year long. They don't have to be from different cultures. Uh, it's, it would always be interesting to have a bulletin board in your building that says that introduces one family at a time. Maybe it's one week, uh, one family a week. And uh, they put pictures up of their home and they're doing them doing things with their children. And, you know, you might find out that some families are traditional families with two parents and two kids and a dog. Or you might find out that you have a, a lot of single parents in your community. Um, you may have uh, families who are living with extended family relatives, or like my family, we have a sandwich family where we have my 92 year old father-in-law living with us and our 16 year old granddaughter. So uh, my husband and I, we're in the middle, we're the meat of the sandwich. And uh, that's a, it's a great place to be most of the time. Um, but celebrate your families all year long because families these days come in all shapes and sizes. Something else you want to consider is uh, your signs. So if you would go to um, the edge of your property and ask yourself, from this vantage point, do I know where to go? How do I get in this school? Where would I um, go to the main office? How would I go to the main office? Um, and if your signage is is there, but it's, uh, and it's clear and concise and culturally sensitive, then you're good to go. But you might also consider, um, you know, putting pictures because not everybody speaks English, right? Or uh, having translations. So those are the two things. Stand at the edge of your corner and ask yourself, are my signs clear? Do people know where to go without feeling lost and confused? 
And then the second part of that is uh, stand on the edge of your property and think, if I don't understand English, how do I know where to go? So uh, it's very important to have clear signs that are bright and cheerful and, and culturally sensitive. Okay. Then <clears throat> identify family parking. You know, if I'm coming up to the school for a parent-teacher conference and I have to park down the street and around the corner, then I might not feel like this campus or this administration uh, cares much about family because look at all the staff parking, but there's nowhere for the family members to park. They want me to come, but there's no place to park my car. So think about your family parking. Um, Improving family parking might just be a matter of identifying five or 10 spaces that are marked specifically for families. Uh, maybe all you need to do is put a yard sign that says um, guest parking or family parking or um, VIP fa uh, family parking. So just do something to make sure that parents know that you want them there and in order for them to be there, you have a parking place waiting for them. Okay, and then evaluate your customer service and ask for family feedback. So part of customer having a, a great uh, customer service experience is uh, training your staff on family engagement and respecting cultures, developing cultural awareness and and what does good customer service look like? Everybody in HEB goes through customer service training and it is um, it makes a huge difference. If I walk into a building and they say, oh, Mrs. Rawl, we're so glad to hear you. We're so glad you're here today. Um, what brings you in? Come on, let me uh, show you to my office or hold on just a second. I'll um, call the principal for you, you know, uh, that is a great experience when I go in a building. But if I go in the building and the person at the front desk doesn't even look at me and they say, hold on, I'll be with you in a second. Okay. You know, and then I start thinking to myself, how long am I going to have to wait? Because they're just on their computer. So um, those are the kinds of things that you want to evaluate. And it's always important to ask for family feedback so that if there is a problem, then you can address it head on. Uh, you really don't want things like that to fester and turn into uh, great big issues when you could nip it in the bud early in the early stages. Okay, so number three, we're gonna talk about engagement at home. So remember, home is every child's primary learning environment. That's where they first started learning. Our campuses are secretary, are, are secondary. And, you know, when families come to an event and they sign the sign-in sheet and we have evidence that they were there and they were engaged in their child's learning, that's great. But a lot of family engagement actually happening at home and is, well, let me say that again. A lot of family engagement, family engagement in the way that we want them to be engaged happens at home and it's invisible to us at school. But what we see are the benefits of family engagement, invisible family engagement. So let's talk about how we can grow that family engagement at home, okay? So our theme for today is art. So the first thing that I want you to know about art is that parents don't have to be and artists themselves. You, as the teacher, don't have to be an artist yourself to create art. And you don't have to go out and buy a lot of fancy supplies or expensive supplies. You can use things that are ready, readily available, crayons, markers, uh, leaves and sticks, sand, you know, all kinds of things can be used to produce art. So if you go on a nature walk and you collect leaves with your kiddos, then great, you have, uh, and you make a collage out of the leaves or some kind of shape, or the children just make their own piece of art using the leaves. Well, 
that's awesome. And that is something that the kids will have fun doing. And they're going to go home and say, mom, dad, look, we made, uh, we made nature art today. And, and here's my picture. I used green leaves in mine, but Susie over here, she used all brown leaves and our pictures look so different, but they're both great. What do you think? Can we do this at home? Well, Yes, as a matter of fact, families can do these kinds of things at home. So once you've done it in your classroom, then you can send home this handy dandy little message in a backpack. So this is explains to families a lot of the things that uh, I just talked about, but it encourages them, encourages them to uh, ask open-ended questions like, what is your plan? How are you going to make that happen? Tell me more about why you use green leaves instead of brown leaves. Okay. It gives suggestions for supplies and materials and things like that. Um, and then it talks about um, how to help your child if they become frustrated while they're working on their art. So this is just one of those things that is um, really nice. It's all on one page. Um, and if you do it in your classroom first, then the kids are going to want to go home and tell their parents all about it and then do it at home. OK, so now you're linking your um, family engagement to what your children, what the children are learning at school, which is one of the most important things you can do to have effective family engagement. OK, I told you I sprinkled a little bit of magic in a music in just for fun. You might remember. Uh, you can make animal music and you might remember this old commercial that went, I think it was a cat food commercial. Meow, 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 meow. Okay. So change the animal. What if it's a duck? Quack, 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 quack. See, that's even hard to do as an adult, but change the sound, change the animal. So it is, um, it is always fun to make music at home with your kids. And then drama is a great way um, for parents to support children at home. So if you talk, if you and you're, you're in your classroom and you talk about how you um, went to the store this weekend and so you drove to the store and you went in and you picked out your fruits and vegetables and then you checked out and, and you sacked your own groceries and you carried your groceries to the car, then your children can think about that. And then they can say, oh, how would that look like if we acted that out? So then you might put kiddos into small groups and say, uh, figure out how you act out uh, going to the store with your family. And then they make their plan and they decide who's going to be who. And they act it out. I, I tell you what, on rainy days, my own children loved to do things like this. It was a lot of fun. Parents can do that. And then after you've done it in school, send home your little message in a backpack. Aren't these fun? Oh, I didn't mean to do that. So now let's talk about how families can use blocks, toys, and games. And you can do all of these things at school too, because you have these things. We have blocks in our centers, right? So here's your message in a backpack. But what I want to uh, tell you about is my grandson, who was about six, you know, we have blocks in our family. They're like the big jumbo Lego blocks. Okay. And he loves to build things. So he says, Hey, Nana, look at this do you know what this is? And I'm like, no, I really don't. But why don't you tell me about it? And he said, this is a parking garage. And so I can, uh, my little cars can go down here in the bottom on the bottom floor and they can, they can park down there. But then when that's full, they can go up here and park in the roof. But you know what? The rooftop is also um, where helicopters land sometimes. So they had to be careful not to park where the helicopter is going to land because then it would smush their cars. And I'm sitting there listening to him thinking, how amazing is that? You know, he used his imagination to build it. And, you know, I was sitting there watching him build it. And I'm like, wow, 
that's a really great structure. You know, look at how um, how all of those are fitting together, and you're leaving that opening at the bottom to for the for whatever reason you're leaving it open. And you know, um, you know, I would ask him questions and just talk to him as he was building his parking garage, but. Um, keeping materials in your classroom, as well as um, families keeping materials at home that their children can do open-ended activities with is uh, very important and is one of the ways that your families can use uh, blocks in all shapes and sizes. You know, some blocks are wooden wooden and different colors. Some come in, some come in different shapes and uh, geometric shapes and sizes. Uh, some of them are uh, little Legos and some of them are big Legos. So um, some of them have letters and numbers on them and others don't. So uh, any kind of block that is available in your classroom, make sure that you're engaging with kids as they're building blocks and encouraging them to use their imagination. Then they're going, going to want to have blocks at home and, and to build things there. Then we can talk about toys. Uh, you know, when I was a little girl, I had dolls and stuffed animals and I would set up, set them all up in rows like they were in my classroom and I would pretend to be the teacher. Uh, go figure. Can you, no wonder I ended up where I am today, but you can use other things. It doesn't have to be dolls and stuffed animals. You can use rubber ducks. You can have rubber duck races. You can tell a story about your rubber duck. Uh, you can create an obstacle course for your rubber duck. Uh, and you know, letting children decide what they're, um, what they're going to do with their rubber duck is always a great idea. So when you do things like this in class, then again, kids are going to go home and they're going to want to do the same kind of thing at home with their rubber ducks. They might do something with cars or they might do something with their Barbies or whatever toys they have at home. But this gives families an idea of how they can use something as simple as a rubber duck to create a learning experience. And then finally, let's talk about playing games. Oh my gosh, some games are so simple, like playing games with bubbles, right? You can have a bubble recipe, uh, recipe. You can have a bubble relay or a bubble tag or a bubble obstacle course. Um, you know, even grownups like to play with bubbles. So it is always um, great fun when you uh, bring bubbles into the situation. Again, if you use them in your classroom, kids are going to go home and they're going to want to um, play with bubbles at home as well. So <clears throat> remember that bubbles can be made very easily. And even this uh, message in a backpack even has a bubble recipe. So that's a whole nother learning experience in and of itself, right? So now we're getting to the science, to science and the outdoors. Oh my gosh, there are so many things that families can do that are related to science when they go outside. So it is important when, uh, for children to explore the world of science. And they can do it at school with you or they can do it at home with their parents. But hopefully it'll happen both places. And um, you can go for a walk, a nature walk and talk about what they see. Um, you can um, make comparisons between uh, living things and non-living things or two living things. Like you can look at two different trees and say, look at the, the tree on look at this tree trunk and look at this tree trunk. How are they alike? How are they different? Science is all around us and we want to encourage our children to be inquisitive and we, they're already curious. So that's what we need to monopolize on. Okay. Um, we want to encourage our families to go beyond the playground. You know, during the school day, we might be forced to stay on the playground, but sometimes you can take walks. You just have to get permission from your um from your administration and your families, but there are lots of things that you can do. But one of the most important things that you can do is help your children be noticers. So practice noticing numbers and letters and 
other things you can do. I spy. Um, and you can look for footprints or colors or signs. Um, I spy with my little eye, a cloud shaped like the letter O, you know, uh, there's, there's no end to what you can do and what families can do when you go outside. And I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't talk about early literacy, early numeracy um, activities that you can use at school that can also be used at home. So here's one message in a backpack that says, talk it up, describe what you're doing, narrate what's an adventure in a story, um, sing with the kids, talk, 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 and talk some more. Read aloud to your child every day. Talk about what your child is doing. So talking is very, very important. It helps build their vocabulary, helps build that, those language structures. Uh, it helps them um, new words. Well, we already talked about vocabulary, but um, so talking is just critical. And then, of course, reading everything and anything and everything with your child um, or with your class. So model reading magazines and newspapers, although we don't see newspapers very much anymore. Write a letter and then read it out loud. Talk about how there are spaces between the words and that the words are made up of letters and words have meaning, those kinds of things. Follow a recipe and talk about the vocabulary that's in the recipe. And then always read a variety of books. Everything from poetry to fairy tales to nonfiction to fiction. There are so many different kinds of things to read these days. Um, encourage your families to read, 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 read. And then if we think about early numeracy, uh, young children are natural mathematicians. We want to talk about math. We want to fill things with containers and then estimate how many jelly beans are in an Easter egg. Or, um, or we want to measure things. Just think about how fun it would be to measure the bat bathtub with daddy's boot and see how many boots it takes to measure the length of the bathtub. Or then use the kiddo's boot or shoe, tennis shoe. Uh, how many kid shoes does it take to measure the bathtub? Now, how is the answer different from the first one? Kids are so excited about things like that. And of course, building things, measuring things, talking about math, counting, uh, counting up, counting back, you know, all of those things are things that kids really enjoy doing. And then the last one that I want to share about math is just remember that math is fun. And the more fun it is, the more likely kids will succeed in math. And it's important to know that even if you don't think you're good at math, you can learn to get better at math. And that's wonderful. You just might not be good at math yet. So um, use as many everyday moments as possible uh, to um, talk about math and math concepts. Okay. So the last section I mentioned earlier was um, behavior. And so this message, message in a backpack is really good because it talks about focus and self-control. And here are some ways to help children um, stay focused on a game or an activity and, um, and then how to control themselves when they need to share things or if they're waiting in line. What are some things that you can do so this gives parents several different ideas. Um, guiding a child's behavior. So uh, what I like about this is it gives them some scenarios, gives families scenarios or situations. Your child is upset and having a temper tantrum. Then it gives them some things to try. You know, children, parents aren't given a manual for how to raise their kids when they uh, have a baby and leave the hospital. 
Um, the other scenario that it gives here, when your child is calm and relaxed, it's a good time to put some things in place to encourage positive behavior. So again, it gives them some suggestions. And a lot of those suggestions might seem like common sense to us, but then again, how many times have you gone, have you ever heard somebody say something really simple and you go, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's so easy. And the, the last one is helping your children solve problems and helping families solve problems with their children. What I really like about this message in a backpack is that it gives some sentence stems that you can commit to memory and then try to practice them whenever this, the situation um, needs it. I know that with my granddaughter, she comes up, comes home from school upset, then it's important just to ask what happened. Because if the school's already called me and filled me in on their version of what happened, and then I just lay into her with, you know better than that, well, she's gonna, she's gonna tune me out right away. But if I ask what happened first and I get her side of the story, then it helps her open up and begin to decompress. Okay, so these are things that if I have these uh, things committed to memory, uh, then, the, then I'm more likely to use them when the situation requires it. And then you know what? Kids might go home to their parents and say, hey, you know, Mrs. Smith um, had to stop uh, little Johnny because he was being mean to uh, Zoe and Zoe cried. And so um, Mrs. Smith said, Johnny, how do you think that made Zoe feel? And uh, next time, if you want to play with the same ball, then uh, ask her, use your words to ask her. So then kids will start repeating what you, the sentences that you're using at home with their families. So uh, these examples are all very important. And that's one of the things that I really like about these messages in a backpack. Just make a copy, throw it in the backpack before they leave. And, you know, the more time that the more that you do the things in class first and then send that home for families to do at home, the better off it's gonna be. Remember, what we're trying to promote is that invisible family engagement. Okay, so we've reached the wrapping up part of our session about family engagement. All of those messages in a backpack are uh, located in this folder. Uh, that you can you can write the link down, take a picture of it. Um, I sure wish I could say that I had created all of these messages, but I did not. They are all from uh, NAEYC. That's the National Association for Educators of Young Children. If you go to their website, you'll be able to find more, uh, and you'll find them in. The, here's the link right here. Um, you'll be able to find more, and then you'll also be able to find them in different languages. Let me just show you. So they have a long list. And if you just go to another page, there you can see um, this is a um, message in a backpack about parent-teacher conferences. And that looks like Chinese to me, but I could be wrong. Uh, but they have them in lots of different languages. Remember that effective family engagement is an art and a science, and uh, that it's a journey, not a destination. I am always looking for new ways to do things that will better meet the needs of our families in HEBISD, and I wish you luck on your journey implementing family engagement. Thank you for watching this video today. Your code word is colors, and you don't need the exclamation point, just lowercase c-o-l-o-r-s. Here is the QR code for the Family Engagement Survey. And if you need the link, uh, there's the link for you right there. That'll take you to it. And then if you have any questions about family engagement that you would like to ask me about, feel free to do so by emailing me or giving me a phone call. Um, my information is also available on the HEBISD website. So feel free to look me up. Um, it's been a pleasure 
sharing some of what I know about family engagement with you. And um, I do hope that uh, something um, just kind of uh, clicked in your head today and you said, oh, I want to try that. Okay. Because if you think, oh, I want to try that about something, then um, my video will have, um, my message will have hit the mark for today. So have a wonderful day. Don't forget to go do your survey. Uh, when you complete your survey, then you will receive an automatic response with a link for your um, certificate. And then you will have the documentation that you need to show your um, su supervisor uh, that you completed uh, all six or seven hours of PD. All right. Have a great day. Thank you very much for your time. And we hope to see you next year.